Hello, hello. I'm Rob Martinez, State Historian of New Mexico. This is New Mexico History in 10 Minutes. I've had more than a few people contact me and ask, what about Southern New Mexico's history? Well, Southern New Mexico has an amazing and brilliant history. Like Northern New Mexico, it has a deep and rich Native American past. Uh, long before any Spanish or other Europeans showed up in the area, there was a diverse group of Native peoples in the area, Apache people, uh, Humanos, uh, other groups such as uh, the Manso people who had communities up and down the Rio Grande down into what's now Mexico. So it's quite an amazing area that has a deep and rich history. So let's get some context here. Uh, the earliest uh, non-native community in that area was Guadalupe del Paso, today Ciudad Juarez in Mexico. It was established in 1659 as a mission, and it was the entranceway into New Mexico throughout the colonial period and into the Mexican period. This means that um, New Mexico was connected to the south by Guadalupe del Paso. Remember the Camino Real del Norte, the Royal Road that connected Santa Fe to Mexico City? Well, it ran through southern New Mexico. Um, people, ideas, food, animals, disease, back and forth, north-south, for over 300 years came through southern New Mexico. So we have to remember that uh, Guadalupe del Paso was New Mexican. There were a lot of people settling in that area uh, from New Mexico in the 1700s and into the 1800s. Also, people were coming up from places like Mexico City, Querétaro, um, Guanajuato, Aguascalientes, Parral, all these points in Mexico during the colonial period and the Mexican period were coming up and living. They were people of Spanish background, mestizo, uh, part African background, Native Americans. Uh, they were uh, diverse people that came and settled in what is now southern New Mexico. Many marrying northern New Mexicans and moving up north into places like Albuquerque, Santa Fe, Santa Cruz, Taos, and all points in between. So we need to remember this. Uh, during the uh, colonial period, you had uh, a lot of activity there. Um, in 1598, when Oñate's colony was moving north, right in that area just north of uh, Las Cruces, what's today Las Cruces, uh, one of the oldest members of the expedition, Pedro Robledo, passed away. And they named a hill, an area after him, called Robledo. He was from the area of Toledo, Spain, um, Maqueda. Um, I've done research there. It's quite a little town uh, just southwest of Toledo. And he brought his whole family here. They, they established themselves in northern New Mexico, marrying into the Romero family and other families. But ultimately, this is the beginning of Spanish presence in the area. We also know that in the White Sands area, uh, a German, uh, Bernardo Gruber, got in trouble with the agent of the Inquisition in Santa Fe and in the 1600s fled south and died in the White Sands area. That's why we call it Jornada del Muerto, the journey of the dead man, because his body, his remains were found there. If you've ever been to that part of New Mexico, it's quite amazing. There's vast Sonoran deserts. Uh, there's high mountains. It's very dry and parched. The Rio Grande winds its way through there. But this place was uh, part of uh, the, the Spanish Empire for the better part of two centuries. When we get into the 1800s, things start to change. Um, with the end of the U.S.-Mexican War, the, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo determines the southern border and also offered New Mexicans the opportunity to leave and move into Mexican territory if they did not want to remain in the U.S. since the U.S. annexed New Mexico. Uh, so 
It's interesting. A group of New Mexicans moved south south of the border, just over the border, to live in Mexico. They would rather live as Mexicanos than Americanos. This was around 1848. This is the town of Mesia. This is the beginnings of uh, later communities in the area. Well, I love this story. They moved south. They incorporate around 1848 in that area. And there you go. They're living in Mexico, but... Within a few years, about five or six years, the Gadsden Purchase puts them back in the United States. Uh, the United States needed that piece of land down there. Uh, they were uh, consolidating uh, the border. There was a dispute. It was no man's land for a while because Mexico claimed one line of the border and the U.S. claimed another. So there was still some tension there. Uh, nonetheless, these poor folks moved south to stay Mexican and then ended up being Americans once again. Well, the whole area eventually is designated Doña Ana, and that's the county down there to this day. And we don't know where that name comes from. Some people think it's named after Doña Ana Robledo, who was a granddaughter of old Pedro Robledo, and she fled uh, with all of her family in 1680 after the Pueblo Revolt, and the story is that she was so distraught and sad uh, passing where her grandfather had died that she herself passed away. Another idea is that there was a woman in the area who had a ranch named Doña Ana Maria de Cordova, and that it might be named for her, the, the community of Doña Ana and the county. Um, we know that Las Cruces comes about around 1848 as well, uh, just like a Mesia, it starts to become incorporated as a town uh, but um, we're not sure when Las Cruces is named. There's some references by Bandelier that uh, there's a document in Mexico City that talks about uh, around 1693, uh, some uh, Spanish soldiers uh, were killed in the area of Los Organos, the mountains, the Oregon Mountains in that area, and uh, that they also uh, were re referenced uh, to a place called Las Cruces in that area. There's also the idea that uh, Governor Antonio de Otermin, who uh, came in 1680, he uh, brought the refugees from New Mexico in the north after the Pueblo Revolt in 1680, might have stayed at a community in that area, um, either named Doña Ana or Las Cruces. Nonetheless, we get the idea that there were settlements in the area, but by the 1700s, uh, they're abandoned. It's just too dangerous. There's attacks by Apache warriors. And so it won't be until the mid-1800s that we see uh, more permanent settlements in the area. Now, the other thing I want to talk about is uh, uh, a town uh, in uh, Las Cruces, Tortugas. Tortugas is a community uh, made up of a, a diverse group of Native Americans. The, uh, two communities originally called uh, Pueblo of Guadalupe and Pueblo of San Juan de Guadalupe. They come together to form Tortugas, and it's a, a mix of peoples. You have Humanos and Sumas, Apaches, Conchos, Raramuri people, um, some say Manso people are living there. They were thought to be gone or extinct, but they're also part of this story. And also, uh, after the 1680 Pueblo Revolt, uh, peoples from the Isleta Pueblo near Socorro, New Mexico, south of Alburquerque, they end up coming south, and some of them uh, settle in this area as well. So it's a, a diverse group of people who are also joined by Genisaro Indians from northern New Mexico who come and make this area their home. Um, Isleta del Sur is a pueblo of uh, native people from New Mexico, those Isletan people, they're Tiwa people who come and settle just north of the Rio Grande. They're still there. They're a, a, a vibrant Pueblo community. And so they're also part of this story of southern New Mexico. So um, keep in mind that by the late 1800s, you also start to see Americans come into this area. The railroad is laid out uh, going from uh, uh, the newer town of El Paso 
um, going from there into southern New Mexico, uh, land from the Gadsden Purchase and into Arizona, across towards California, California. So um, you also have a lot of Americans coming and settling in this area. So by, say, 1900, you have uh, diverse Native American peoples, uh, Mexican New Mexicans, Mexican people still coming across the border into uh, Texas and New Mexico, and of course, Americans of diverse backgrounds from the East coming as well. So that's it for now. Thank you for joining me. I'll see you next time. Goodbye. Adios.